This is our second Medicaid Town Hall brought to you by the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and the Rhode Island Dental Association. My name's Sam Swetchkenbaum. We'll have a little presentation this evening. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the societal impact of oral care services, some Medicaid policies and a toolkit that we're working to develop, talk about public health dental hygienists, community health workers in dental offices, and then we'll take a deep dive into our oral health pilot to help patients utilizing home and community-based services. Just some introductions. Again, my name's Sam Swetchkenbaum. We have Sophie Asa with us, who's the project manager at the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. I'd like to thank Chris Durant and the Rhode Island Dental Association. And then we'll have Omar Reyes, who is the Director of Adult Programs and Policies at the Rhode Island Office of the Post-Secondary Commissioner. I see Steve Brown on the line. Thanks, Steve, for joining in. Does anybody from the Rhode Island Dental Association want to bring greetings this evening? Greetings, everyone. This is Steve Brown. Hello, hello. I'm going to turn it over to Omar Reyes to talk about his work and also the societal impact of oral care services. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Reyes. I'm the Director of Adult Programs and Policies at the Rhode Island Office of the Post-Secondary Commissioner. We are the state agency that oversees the public colleges in the state of Rhode Island uh, and ensures that people are being treated uh, right by our institutions. Today, I'm here to talk to you about what's what we call the Rhode Island Reconnect a program slash initiative that we launched uh, back in 2019 and how it relates to the really important work around oral care. Give you a little bit of context. So Rhode Island Reconnect is an initiative that helps adults who need career guidance and educational guidance in hopes that it would lead to a post-secondary degree or credential. In 2018, we received half a million dollars from this big higher education foundation called the Lumina Foundation to really make a big campaign on getting non-traditional students or adult students to go back to school. We were getting ready to launch in 2020, March 15th of 2020. And that is when, you know, obviously COVID was happening. We really had to rethink our initiative and what we wanted to do with it. Because obviously if you have, you know, we had a major pandemic, lots of people lost their jobs and it didn't make sense to make a marketing plan for people to return back to higher education if there was a lot of financial uncertainty and these new barriers to return to school were not being addressed. So we partnered with the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training to offer what we call wraparound supports to anyone in one of their short-term job trainings. And it was pretty remarkable. Um, we had two major components to this Rhode Island Reconnect program. The one is the navigators that provide an individualized assessment and one-on-one -on -one sessions to help individuals get where they want to go. And then the other aspect was that ability to use uh, state resources and, and financial resources to help with any obstacles that may prevent someone from graduating, from finishing a training, and or from getting a job after the training was over. So our navigators were designed to really assess any barriers that participants in these short-term job trainings uh, had to completion. And we started to see something, a, a trend that we did not really expect. So we had funds to help with things such as groceries, such as transportation costs, car repairs, utility bills, that kind of stuff. But what we realized very quickly was that people had all these other needs that were more side of the box. So dental work was one of them, medical was one of them, medical bills, uh, the ability to see a therapist, a substance abuse, th those kind of things that really make a difference and prohibit uh, participation into the workforce. Uh, I'll never forget the day that we had um, this nice young woman in, uh, in a CNA class who, you know, studying to be a CNA and she came, uh, she wanted to speak to the manager, I happened to be that, and she confided in me that she felt that she wasn't getting hired or wasn't being taken seriously in interviews, and that people even in her own class were, were being so nice to her because of the condition of her oral care, and she, she had a couple of her front tooth were not looking so, were not looking great, 
And so she said, I feel like no one's going to hire me looking like this. And that was a big transformational moment in our Rhode Island Reconnect program because we were able to, to, to really see that this is a legitimate barrier to the workforce, a legitimate barrier to people feeling confident and and to not being in pain while while they're you know looking to better themselves and, 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 and contribute to our economy. So you know we were able to get her to get a quote from the dentist and we were able to get her to get some new work uh, done and some oral care done. And I remember a couple couple weeks later I got a picture of her with it smiling and it said my new smile and PS I got a job right so that that you know which is pretty pretty remarkable uh, and pretty amazing I cannot overstate the importance of oral care how big of a barrier it is to some folks entering the job market and to some folks feeling confident in in the job market and in interviewing it, it's such a big important part of what we do that we don't think of but that it's 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 really, uh, really crucial. And, and since then, we've had, I think, about 30 or 40 people that we've paid for dental work for because either they didn't have insurance or the, the some for some of the trainings that we have some, uh, we'll call them upskilling training, some people that are underemployed. In some, in some cases, some of them couldn't afford the dental insurance. That presents a huge barrier to folks uh, entering the job market. As we mentioned earlier, th there's a lot of things that we can help with for the sake of this conversation. We, we focus on the dental bills, but there's technology, transportation, childcare, uh, groceries, anything that is a legitimate barrier to completing of a job training and or getting a job after, then it's something that we can look into and cover uh, for the most part. I want to thank you all for taking the time uh, to listen to me today. And I really would like to, again, overstate how it, it, oral care is just such a, an important part of our economy and our workforce. It's unfortunate that people still judge folks on, on physical appearances in that work, but it is the reality of the world that we live in today. So I think it's really, it's really an important part to get more people access to oral care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. I appreciate you sharing this example of how here in Rhode Island, and obviously in so many ways, oral health makes such a difference. In addition to the rates over the last several years, some of the changes, so we've tried to keep things up to date, posterior composites were added along with scaling and route planning with prior authorization. When we add procedures, because we would love feedback from, from folks on procedures to add, Ideally, those procedures would be budget neutral, but of course we appreciate support for any budget proposals to the legislature. We did an update to the Medicaid provider manual that was posted in October, kind of to clean things up. But now that it's been cleaned up, we're getting feedback from providers on questions. And so over the next uh, few weeks, we hope to just make things a little clearer for folks. We know that it can be confusing, and sometimes when people who are actively using it put eyes on it and see confusing language, it's really helpful to us so we can make some changes. So how to find the provider manual? If you go to the EOHHS website under providers, look under provider and partners, as you're gonna select dental services, scroll down to provider reference manual, and then you will open the dental manual. We're working together to make a toolkit that we will have nicely in both PDF form and for those who request it in printed form. We'll have information about how to enroll as a Medicaid provider. We'll have frequently asked questions about Medicaid. We'll have a section on any misconceptions about Medicaid. You know, we hear from people, oh, I have to take every single person. No, it's up to the provider to determine how many patients they want to take. And just some strategies. There have been some great resources out there on participating with Medicaid. One that was done with the MISDA program and RIDA a few years ago. Uh, we'll have information on how to work with community health workers, some questions about uh, billing. So these will all be available as resources. We had some, some interest in, and Sophie will be talking about our project, which uses public health dental hygienists. 
I know there have been some questions about public health dental hygienists. So what is a public health dental hygienist? These are experienced dental hygienists who get some advanced training, which allows them to provide preventive dental services in public health settings. These are residences of homebound, nursing homes, community health centers, and schools. They carry their own malpractice insurance. They require a written collaborative agreement with a licensed dentist. To be a public health dental hygienist and take the classes through CCRI, they must be a registered dental hygienist. There's a minimum of three years full-time experience as a dental hygienist or 4,500 hours of clinical experience. We'll also, as part of the project, put together a toolkit for public health dental hygienists. There are a lot of questions that come up and hopefully this will be very helpful. I had heard a question the other day that said, somebody must be referred to a dentist in X number of weeks. And I hope the toolkit can clarify those that language a little bit. So it'll be an expansion of what's currently in the regs to help clarify for those who are using it. With our project to work with public health dental hygienists, we're hoping that public health dental hygienists can expand the reach of providers, dentists who are working with public health dental hygienists, either as a hired staff member or through a collaborative agreement can really make a difference in reaching homebound individuals. There are homebound individuals who are recently discharged from the hospital, patients who may have limited access, but these things can really make a difference. This can actually supplement the dentist business model. They can bill if the public health dental hygienist is working for the dentist, they can bill for preventive care services. There is also a home call, D9410, which dentists can use. Dentists can work with teledentistry, where the public health dental hygienist has done a full evaluation, loaded exam information and radiographs on the cloud. The dentist can review that asynchronously and complete the exam using teledentistry. Finally, this is just a, a way to reach populations. Really loading them with preventive care is a way to prevent problems that ultimately could lead to more costly services. We're excited to collaborate to bring more training to public health dental hygienists, and we hope that those dental hygienists who are considering becoming public health dental hygienists will take advantage of some programs and hopefully work with their dental office to engage in outreach to patients who are at home. Sophie, I'm going to turn this over to you to talk about community health workers. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so yeah, we are going to, as Sam mentioned, we're um, sharing multiple resources that dentists can use to ensure practice success. One of them is the public health dental hygienist to allow hygienists to go out and reach our heart to contact clients. And another is using community health workers. For those of you who don't know, community health workers are the frontline public health workers and they're trusted members of the communities that they serve. And they really function as a bridge between individuals and the health and human services field. They are able to distill information down in layman's terms and just provide people information on such as, you know, how to connect with a dentist, how to schedule an appointment, what things are you expected to bring, what, what is a standard dentist visit like, what are the questions you ask a dentist. This is all knowledge that community health workers are able to provide individuals. And I just provided a, a bunch of examples related to dentistry. Community health workers are very beneficial aspect of any part of healthcare. My previous work, we used community health workers to improve birth outcomes in the city that I lived in, and they were really helpful connecting women to OBGYNs and all those services, and community health workers can have similar impacts in dentistry. So in order for an individual to become trained as a community health worker, there are three training organizations offered uh, here at Rhode Island. And as I said, community health workers are really that bridge between individuals in the health system. They're able to deliver culturally appropriate health education and information to individuals. And they're also really able to advocate for individuals and provide them community needs. They can use the terminology that they might not know how to appropriately present their concerns to a dentist or a physician and community health workers are able to be there for their clients to make sure that they are understanding the the care that you as a dentist are asking them to do and that they're able to apply it 
like in their own lives. They also, after going through their training, become certified through the Rhode Island Certification Board. And I've listed out a couple of ways that CHWs can be really helpful in a dentist's office. They are able to also use motivational interviewing to help clients set realistic goals for themselves and understand their circumstances. And they're also a really great way to lower the barrier to people trying to access care. We've heard a lot of concerns about being able to access appointments and uh, having difficulty getting to the dental clinic to make it to their biannual appointments and a community health worker would be the individual to let a client know like here is a voucher that you can use to use public transportation to get to the bus or these are ways to get these are the services that are available to you as a medicaid client and a CHW you can really help lower those barriers and help minimize any sort of confusion or anything that might happen in the dentist clinic with the client and then as i said community health workers are really helpful in every aspect of healthcare, but RIDO has developed a very specific oral health related training program for community health workers in association with SHORI, the Community Health Worker Association of Rhode Island. It's actually being offered right now. The next session is this Wednesday evening, and though there will be more CHWs that are educated about the importance of oral health care and able to provide that information to their clients. Now that we pro provide information about like what is a community health worker, can also provide some instructions on how to integrate them into a dental clinic. So community health workers can also be, their services can be charged as a Medicaid service. So this would require a provider, any type of provider, if they were enrolled as a Medicaid provider, they can also enroll as a community health worker provider. And then as the CHW is providing their services, doing that motivational interviewing, those services can be billed in 15-minute um, increments. There'll be an additional slide afterwards to explain that. And then another way to use community health workers are if you have a patient in your clinic and you notice that they need additional services, such as they're experiencing food insecurity, unstable housing, they might be experiencing physical, emotional abuse. CHWs are really helpful to be able to connect patients to those necessary services. The CHWs and similarly like social workers and people, individuals in the social services field are very connected on the on the medical side. And we think that CHWs could be a really great way to make sure that dentists also are able to help their patients beyond they come in and they have this concern, the CHWs are able to assist them and get them the right services that they need. As I had mentioned, there is an, a specific oral health training for CHWs offered by RIDO. Another suggestion is current office staff could also receive CHW training and that way they have that additional background knowledge. They're very much focused on the social determinants of health and are able to acknowledge all of those barriers that prevent individuals from being able to get access to care and are really helpful in connecting individuals with those services to ensure that they get the care that they need and have better outcomes long term. I'll just add, Sophie, I think this is a, a great opportunity because we had heard from dental offices as we've reached out to try to encourage more people to participate in Medicaid, of course, the first thing people have mentioned is the rates. But the second thing I've heard from people is, of course, well, oftentimes the patient is not able to make it to the appointment or they missed appointments or they're delayed to the appointments. But our hope is that community health workers will help reduce those challenges. Or I had a patient and, you know, at first, she, she thought she, you know, she came back, I had only done impressions and she thought she was going to get her dentures right away. So community health workers can help maybe smooth out that communication, especially in challenging situations. Or another provider talked about some behaviors that the patient was exhibiting and community health workers can really, really spend some time with the patient and just try to make your work with them more effective and more efficient. So I think it's an exciting opportunity. And the training we've adapted from the Smiles for Life oral health curriculum for frontline health workers. This is something that's been used around the country to give oral health terminology to community health workers, to make them aware of who are the people in the dental office, what are some resources. So we got an excellent question. So an example of use of community health workers was at Tri-County Health Center in Johnston, they brought in a community health worker 
who started going after the list of patients who had been no-shows. You know, oftentimes we say, oh, patients haven't shown up for appointment. We sort of forget about them. But they really wanted to go after and find out what were the challenges. So the, this community health worker's job was to reach out and ultimately make phone calls. And again, I know your front desks in private practices do this all the time, but this is an individual who's doing it. They had a no-show rate that was up to 32%. And in just nine weeks, they had gotten it down to 26%. Again, it's not perfect, but it made a huge difference and it really paid for itself. Thank you for that example, Sam. And like I had mentioned, we wanted to let you all know about the policies of using community health workers. So if you are a Medicaid provider, you can also enroll as a CHW provider. And then for each service that the CHW provides, there is a they get billed in 15 minute increments of time. And there isn't um, you can clarify this, Sam, for me, but it, you're able to bill for the services the CHW does if they get if they're there. And they, you know, you have your hygienist that does a cleaning and the CHW provides that motivational interviewing. Both of those, serv- those are different services. Both of those services can be billed and um, reimbursed by Medicaid. So as long as they have the appropriate training, you're enrolled as a provider, you can take advantage. There is a system in place to utilize the CHWs beyond the office staff, and they're able to provide additional guidelines to uh, to patients. So if a dental provider chooses not to enroll as a CHW, they they could outreach to a CHW who could then bill themselves, right? So there, there's an alternative. A dental office could enroll as a CHW provider and then engage a CHW provider, bill for their services, and then pay the CHW separately. Or if a dental office is like, I don't know if I want to do this, but I want a CHW, if they access a CHW, And we'll be providing some information on how you can find a CHW. The CHW, if they bill themselves, then they can also, that's the other way to do it. We also have a question in the chat regarding the CHW training. I don't know if that's specific to the oral care training. That is offered for free through Shwari, correct? Yes. So yes, the specific oral health training is free for CHWs. And I guess the question may have been, though, if a front desk person at a dental office wanted to become a certified community health worker. Is there tuition for that? I see Ariana shared something in the chat with us about CHWs. There is a free community health worker card competency training for people to prepare participants in entry-level CHW positions in community-based social services, healthcare, and behavioral health settings. There are 12 modules um, that align with the competencies defined by the Rhode Island Certification Board. Each module is two hours of live Zoom training, four hours of training activity, and a total of 72 training hours. Thank you very much for that quick search, Ariana. And there is an upcoming session that starts on January 13th, and the deadline to apply is December 19th. We will have all of that information available for you all and can share it with you. Um, The next slide is still about the CHWs. Uh, More specifically, wanted to provide you all some specific codes that could be used for the CHW services. Um, Just for background, like I said, I previously did a lot of work with community health workers in the infant and maternal mortality space. I worked for a nonprofit and we specifically trained CHWs on proper prenatal care, proper pregnancy routines to share information to share with women. The agency I work for, the CHWs would do home visits with individuals, identify their specific needs and connect those patients to those services and follow up with them and make sure that they were getting the services included transportation, education, seeing a dentist, my company, we did make sure that there was dental care, uh, having a PCP. And that's just one example of one company that it was able to make a really big difference in individuals' lives and getting them the care that they needed and also just educating them on the care that they need. Because similar with dentistry, there's a lot of misconceptions around pregnancy and CHWs are there to help address those misconceptions and make sure that people are going to the right services that they need. I'm very happy we were able to share this information for the first time for some of you about community health workers, and I hope that people are able to see the way that they can be utilized in a dental clinic and can really improve people's experiences at the de- at the dentist and encourage them to continue to get care. The other exciting way I've seen community health workers used, and this is out of a project done in Denver, Colorado, 
was educating about drinking tap water. Folks who may come from countries where they're not accustomed to drinking the water may assume that when they come here to Rhode Island that our water is not safe to drink. But we know that not only is Rhode Island's water safe to drink, it's got cavity-fighting fluoride. So this project that he did in Denver, they used community health workers to go out to people with similar lived experiences and share that if you drink tap water, it's much better for your teeth than obviously sugar sweetened beverages. So that's a project we'd like to do here as well in Rhode Island. We are going to dive into the home and community based oral health care pilot program that we uh, started talking about a bit during the first session and want to present to you kind of the layout of establishing oral care in these home and community based settings. What we're seeing right now is that there's a movement of older adults staying in nursing homes to now wanting to stay in their own homes and receiving care there. Between 2004 and 2014, the population of adults over the age of 65 increased over 28%. However, the number of people in nursing homes during that same time period decreased by 12%. And we know that those numbers are decreasing even more. COVID accelerated that shift and more people are trying to shift out of nursing homes. So as this shift is occurring, we are looking to use this pilot project to ensure that the same level of care that is required in nursing homes is also being established in home care services. Individuals in nursing homes are supposed to get assistance from the nurses and CNAs on daily mouth care activities such as brushing their teeth, flossing, cleaning their dentures, and those various activities. And there uh, isn't a similar established model in place in home care settings. So what this pilot seeks to do is establish said model through increasing oral health literacy among these home and community-based services providers. Um, step one of that is training them on the importance of oral health and how it connects to overall health care. And step two of that is training these providers on being able to assist with the daily mouth care tasks because we want to make sure that the clients are still receiving those preventative services. And then the next step of that would be embedding the oral care plan within the home health care medical plan. As I said, in nursing homes, there is that established model, but in the home and community-based servicing services setting, there is none. And this pilot project is wanting to establish one and prove that increased access to preventative services creates better outcomes in the long run. Part of why we presented public health dental hygienists to you all earlier is that they would be a great way to access a lot of these homebound individuals and make sure that they are receiving these preventative services, whether it be in their home or in a long-term care facility. Just in public health dental hygienists are able to go out in the community and provide this care to people. And then ideally, after the hygienist uh, provides the services to, to the top of their ability, they would be able to re refer those patients out to a dentist for additional services that are required. Um, this is the layout for our, our pilot. We're trying to establish a, a system that can obviously live beyond the realm of the pilot and really ensure that all Rhode Islanders, whether you're in a nursing home or at you're receiving care in your home, your oral health care is not being overlooked. So in terms of being able to participate in the pilot, this is a this is a state funded project. There will be funds available to people that participate. But in order to participate, there is an application process called a, a request for proposal or an RFP that will be posted ideally in late January slash early February. And this will get up information from dentists that would like to participate and expand their services to a more public health mindset and reaching more patients that might not be able to come into the dentist clinic as regularly. And this will require information such as where is your practice located? What is your capability? How many patients can you take on being able to share data about the services that you're providing to patients so we're able to understand the type of care that they're receiving. We want to make sure that this pilot is effective and we want to make sure that the model we're setting in place is an effective business model that dentists can implement in their own practices. So there will be like a quarterly meeting where we're gathering with participants to figure out what's working, what's not working, and how we can improve this program. We're presenting to dentists and dental hygienists today, but the there will also be an RFP that's put out for these home and community-based services to also be part of the pilot. So you'll apply for the pilot, everyone will submit, 
there's about a 30 day submission period. And then once all of those applications are submitted, there's a 30 day review period. We'll go through and review the application. There's a point system. Everything will get graded and scored. And then based on the applicants, there'll be numerous factors that are taken into consideration. The location of the practices, number of patients they're able to take on, a number of patients that are number of home health care agencies that are participating, where are they located, and ensuring that the home health care agencies and the dental practices that are a part of this project, we are selected in the uh, most effective way possible that creates the most success for the project. And then speaking of success, a lot of the outcomes for this pilot is to establish a sustainable system that supports dental professionals and provides increased preventative care to patient populations with historically limited access to care. Biggest thing is increasing the oral health literacy and capacity for screening, risk assessment, and daily mouth care of the traditional HCBS workforce. This is really key to integrating these medical and dental models. Patients see their, their physicians much more frequently than they see dentists, so we're ensuring that the people that they come come into contact most frequently are also educated about the importance of oral care and are providing that information to their clients, being able to see if there are any changes in their mouth or gums, giving a heads up, go see your dentist, there's something going on, we need to get this checked out and get you the care that you need. Next up of this would be establishing a sustainable business model for dental clinics. We had talked about this in the first session, the Medicaid rates have been increased for the first time since 1992. And then we've also provided a couple of ways for practice success, including community health workers that are able to access these hard to reach clients and their services are also billable. So we're establishing a model that extends care, but also make sure that dental clinics are able to support this expansive model that we are seeking to establish. And, and in that is, you know, increasing the dental workforce, helping develop our current hygienists to be able to become public health dental hygienists, and ideally want them to stay in the field and have greater job satisfaction. There are dental hygienists that we've talked to and surveyed, and a lot of them are interested in working in a public health setting. And we're hoping that this pilot will allow them to have some flexibility. Dental clinics are able to also expand to a public health model, and then all of the participants are able to have greater satisfaction in providing care in different ways that they might have never thought of before. And then finally, the overall goal of this is to really decrease the number of individuals using emergency rooms for these preventable dental conditions. In 2019, over 5,000 people went to the emergency department for oral pain, and that resulted in over $18 million of of a mostly preventable care. We know over half of the people that are going to the emergency department are Medicaid beneficiaries. So if we can increase the number of preventative services that they're able to access, we can hopefully decrease the number of people that are going to ERs that are not well equipped to handle those concerns. So these are what we are wanting to accomplish with this pilot. And we are hoping to get participation from uh, dental hygienists, from dentists. And the final line is this is a really great opportunity to expand dentistry. We want to make sure that dentistry is not left behind and they're able, it's able to change as well, but in a way that's sustainable and in a way that's beneficial both to providers and to clients. If you have any additional questions about the pilot, you can please reach out to me or you can also ask here. But that is our, our vision and we are hoping to get that our application out in late January, early February, and hopefully get some dentists on board. Yeah, just to wrap things up, I think that was a great overview. We're seeing increased number of folks using home and community-based services, whether it's hired home health aides, whether it's other related caregivers. And ideally, if they can get basic mouth care services provided on a daily basis, if they're functionally dependent, just as they would if they were in a nursing home from a CNA, that'll be hugely beneficial then bringing in public health dental hygienists to provide preventive dental care in concert with their uh, dental office or independent of it using a collaborative agreement. However, these arrangements are made, we look forward to supporting it through the RFP, which should have additional funding to bring equipment as needed. Our next steps, we have one more session 
where we will, again, take any questions. If folks submit questions to either Sophie or myself, we have a next session, we'll have somebody from Gainwell who will answer some questions about enrolling and uh, we'll continue the discussion. So the next session is on December 19th. We'll have some additional information. We'll have a recording of this session and the previous session on the EOHHS YouTube channel. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate everybody's partnership. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a good night and thank you, Omar, for joining us.